All right. Is there any sound? Can anyone hear me? Let's see if, if anything is working. Okay, so I, I, let's see if, if the sound is working right now. Finally. Now is, okay, we have a sound. Thank you. So, things. What I was saying is that today we're going to be talking about Magnus Carlsen and his secrets so, uh, about like how he's able to win. And essentially the most important thing, which is uh, like what you can take from his games and apply in your own. So, let's get started and take a look. This was a game that was played between Carlsen and Lico in 2009. And I think it serves as a brilliant introduction to what uh, you really need to do so you can resemble his way of play. So after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, Carlson played d4. So black played e takes d4, knight takes d4, and bishop c5. Now, something interesting that Carlson does is he doesn't actually go on and move along complicated lines. Yet, he always loves gaining more space in the opening. And sometimes that requires very simple method, very simple possibility just to play the opening. Theoretical, but simple at the same time. It was great. So, after that last move, essentially, bishop to e3 was played, and then black chose to continue with queen f6. C3 and 97. Now, I'm not commenting on those moves simply because everything is more or less straightforward there. It's a pretty easy position. And, uh, okay, after knight e7, white plays bishop c4. So, as you can see, one of the things that Carlsen loves to do is basically make sure that every piece it, it gets developed and uh, towards the center. So, that's all we do in this type of position. And, uh, okay, so after that last move of bishop c4, black does knight e5, bishop e2, and queen g6. Now, I'd like to point out the first critical position here, which is right now. Apparently, with his last move, black is attacking on both of our pawns on g2 and e4. So essentially, this suggests we'll likely have to lose a pawn. Now. That's not very pleasant by any means. And yet we have to figure out exactly how to continue. Now I'd like to know what do you guys think should be White's best continuation at this point and uh, where he should go about that. It's a pretty important position and we have to think carefully. What's the best way to go? Now I'd like to hear your uh, your suggestion. So. What do you think White's got to do now? Hmm. Bishop f3, castles. Yes, all these moves are good. But you know, uh, first of all, let's remember that opening is all about development. It's not about a perfect strategy. And it's neither about a perfect development. It's about quick development. And of course, if we can make it more active and better, that's great. All I needed to do was just a castle, letting black to take the pawn on e4, because taking the e4 would have just failed black in general. Knight b5 could have happened, threatening c7 as well as threatening c5. The black king is going to be in a severe danger. So you can see that uh, the reality is if bishop takes the e3 takes place, white can just take down c7. And... Now, you understand why such strategies like attacking or anything simply does not work. Why it doesn't work? It doesn't work because a player needs quite a bit of preparation and, more importantly, development before he's able to succeed with these moves. Now, Black didn't quite do it. And this is exactly what Carlsen exploited. You see... In the games of Carlsen, you're going to find something which I actually love to say is simplicity. Everything perfect is simple. I've always said that about chess, and not only. 
See, the simpler you make it, the lesser chance for mistake there is. And the lesser chance for mistake there is, the more mistakes your opponent is likely going to make. So you can exploit them. That is, I think, the philosophy of his play. And he's doing it beautifully well. Very similar to Karpov, actually, the way he was able to win many of his games. So what should White try to do now? Black obviously saw the danger of knight b5. So he did some useful move. And he's preparing bishop h3, which will come in case of knight b5. Like if White jumps out with his knight, Black is more than enough prepared to deliver bishop h3. And we can see that next move, of course, if White takes and king d7 or king d8 comes, there's a double attack here and there, which is going to put White in a difficult position. If White chooses something like g3 or whatever, Black can even cancel long, so it doesn't work. Okay. <clears throat> We cannot do that now. What else should white try? What would happen uh, if, if the queen goes to c6? Okay. If the queen goes to c6, you mean earlier on. If the black queen goes to c6, like probably with queen takes d4, knight b5, queen c6. Uh, I don't think that would have worked, actually. If he plays it like that, most likely white will just exchange. And after the recapture, he had queen d4. This move creates a threat against both the queen and the knight, and as we can see, the queen gets a little overloaded right now. If it exchanges with the recapture, white would have had an attack both against the knight and the pawn. So that doesn't work. And um, thereby, after knight b5, black would have been in trouble. So actually, black prepared himself well. He played d6, and he's good. Now, what to do here? Knight d2. Um, I got this, uh, this is a suggestion. I don't mind it. Knight d2 is a quiet, simple move. And maybe after bishop h3, we could do bishop f3. I mean, that's simple. But it's passive. See, I want you to make the difference. Simple and passive are two very different things. When you play simple, you are building up a good position. When you play passive, you are basically deteriorating quality of your position. You don't want to play passive. Being, being passive basically suggests you're going to put your pieces at backward, passive, for defensive positions, thereby you can't have too much. Now, um, one of you said bishop h5, not a bad idea, but truth be told, um, that bishop isn't going to do anything. So here is a good suggestion that Carlson chose. He chose upon f4. Now, this was beautiful. The move f4 drives away black's only strong piece. It opens the f2 for the rook in case he attacks with bishop h3. And more importantly, it kind of provokes black to engage even more tactics, like queen takes d4, which will further on uh, help white to take the initiative over. As white plays the move of bishop f2 now, we can see that there is knight d2 or even rookie one. Black's pieces, like his king and many of the others, are fairly backward. And if he chooses to retreat, now you understand once again the advantage over development. I mean, oh, development over, over pawns or any material. Like takes, capture, takes, and then we win the piece. See? Now, you have to understand that making things simple does not making does not mean making things passive. On the contrary, simple must always relate to active play. Active means the opposite to defending and being backward. It means to choose the advanced moves that challenge the opponent's pieces and drive them back. So as you can see, white is playing very naturally, while black is actually trying to choose and, and deliver some, I don't know, weird strategy in order to win a pawn and he did he did win a pawn bishop f2 now black played very smart he exchanged white's strong knight that was taking away good squares like uh, f5 and c6 from the queen white apparently had to take back with the pawn I mean, he could have taken back with the bishop but then nothing nothing great would have happened i mean the, not the bishop would have been challenged Taking would have led to this, so we were going to lose quite a bit of our initiative. Even a move like this would have been prevented. So White took back with the pawn, thereby opening a very valuable square for his knight. So far, we just see the development stage.
here we have a critical moment. Knight five to g6. So white has got into two bishops. He gained some space. Black is definitely behind in development and not so great with his king being on e8. So what should white try to do right now? Was White's position better because he had a better preparation? Absolutely, he did. But um, what do we do now? Knight g4 couldn't have happened, as he said, because of the two attackers we have out there. Is knight c3 good? A lot of people would suggest that move, and it makes sense. Why not? Let's attack the queen, and we can threaten him on with knight b5, and it looks good. But it, but it really doesn't. You see, there comes a point in the game in which you have to decide on the balance. And what I'm talking about is that you would really like to fuel your attack with forcing attacking moves. Yet, if you don't really see a good follow-up, like a good effic efficiency of any of them, like how they could give you a chance to destroy the opponent or take some advantage or grow your position, then probably this is the time where you've got to consolidate. White so that knight c3, knight b5 wouldn't lead to anything. It would have just given black a chance to take the pawn and do well. So thereby, white played a very weird move. He did g3 in order to prepare knight c3 and build up. Now, seeing and playing a move of g3 with confidence is not something that everybody could do. And yet, I find that brilliant, absolutely terrific, how that move happened after we started, and it almost after what, what we almost looked like a like a powerful or, or super strong initiative. It did happen just like that. So, how do you find moves like G three? Think about it. There are two ways on how you can lead your attack: moves that are either forcing like attacks, checks, captures, direct threats, or you know, like problems against him or reinforcing moves that help you to consolidate, get more pieces, and bring over your attack. Now, if you don't have any special forcing move, anything that a forcing move will give you as a big advantage, then I recommend you wait. Take a moment or two to consolidate, prepare, and similar to racing, change your tires, get some new fuel, and get back in the game. That's what happened here as white played queen knight to c3. But hold on, Valeri, you're going to say, this is, isn't it slow? I mean, black just castled. He's going to move his queen back, and he's a pawn up, right? Oh, well, yeah. So what am I talking about? I don't know. I guess you have to figure it out. So what should white do now? He's a pawn down. It almost looks like his attack is done. And uh, what to do right now? Very good question. Very good question. Does anybody have a suggestion on how White should expand this position or to try to produce certain threats or attacks against Black at this point? Forcing and reinforcing. I like that. Rook C1. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Now, I guess, I gather you realize that a move like bishop d3 isn't really going to work out too well. Because black is just going to move his queen up here and there's nothing out there. So you want to reinforce your rook and maybe bring it in. It's not a bad idea. But the move just doesn't work. Black will do d5, will block us, and then most of our pieces are sitting back. So that doesn't, doesn't quite fit. Damn, look good. It really did. So, if a forcing move doesn't work, and if a reinforcing move doesn't work, what the hell are we doing here? I mean, that was a disaster, wasn't it? No. Now, I want you to understand that there is a third kind of moves. Now, we have moves that challenge the opponent, and we have moves with which we bring new pieces, or we stabilize, we make what we need to do. But then the third kind of moves are the moves with which we basically choose to restrain our opponent 
to restrict him as much as possible. And that makes a lot of sense. The moment Black plays alongside Queen F5 gives White a chance to play with D5. Now this was a brilliant move. It's the third kind of moves, and we call them restrictive moves. With the move of D5, what is he taking away good space from Black so that he cannot make moves like Knight C6 or so? And at the same time, we've got moves like Bishop to D4 or Queen D4. So we realize that D5 is something more than just a, a nice preparatory move. It's a move that limits Black and keeps him back. Now, remember something I've mentioned in one of the previous webinars. What is the ultimate goal of attack? Now, check me. Okay. Now, what is the second goal? Winning material. Okay. So what is the third? Because sometimes we can't check me and sometimes we can't win material. So if you don't have that, why are you leading an attack? It's to make pressure, to keep the opponent on the backside so when things happen, he doesn't get to have the pieces enough to confront. Now, this is very important to understand because essentially White's playing towards that goal. He doesn't have a way to checkmate, he doesn't have a way to win material, but he's restricting Black, and that gives him a chance to cut off many of Black's opportunities. Rook e1, here, rook c1, bishop d7, and bishop f3. See, Carlson does that one step at a time, improving his position, improving that Black's extra pawn really doesn't matter a thing. So Black plays rook c8. He's hoping to defend the pawn as he can push it due to the weakness on d6. So he moved the rook to at least have it defended. And I'd like you to think about White's next move. Now, while you're thinking about that, I do like to tell you that there is a fantastic course that's being offered just for the time of this uh, webinar. It's a fantastic 80, like this is like 87 courses that are being offered in the next uh, few hours. And uh, I do want to tell you that it's it's offered at a fantastic discount, a 50% discount, 87 Grandmaster and Master courses by a Chess Lecture. So essentially, you can take a look at the link below the video or actually click on the link in the chat. It's uh, something that you could definitely benefit. It's high quality, different opening, middle game, strategic courses. And especially talk, there are some courses that especially talk about the thought process behind the champion's minds. It's it's fantastic. Now, going on, what should white do? Queen b3, absolutely. This is one of the active, threatening moves that drive a pressure against b7. While, yes, we could have our development completed. Perfect. After that move, black played b5. OK. I mean, I, I'm guessing white didn't do so bad with all this. It's just, why should it be? Things look good, and he's well prepared and very nicely set. So, what's the uh, what what's the what's the trouble? We have what what it takes, so that our position is great. So, what do we do next? A four, you said, not a bad idea, but you know, um, if we play with a move of a four, Black will likely take that pawn, and uh, I mean, if he takes it. We could still capture, but then he's likely going to do rook d8, and, and things are not going to be too good. Um, what I think is that we need a different so, sort of a move. Something else. Let's think about what we're missing, really, in this position. Rook takes c7 doesn't work. He's just going to capture you, and then there's nothing. You likely lose material there. That's not good. Mm -mm. So what else can we try? <clears throat> Anyone? Knight e2. Totally. See, this is a perfect move. Really good. The moment we place that knight up there, we have the opportunity to step in and not just to attack him, but then regroup our knight at the best place available. It's strong, 
it's effective. Exactly. That's called regrouping. A lovely move candidate with the idea to just move forth and create quite a bit of problem against black. Now, apparently when you look at such a move, there constantly arises the question, okay, Valeria, am I... Am I, am I having the time to do this? I mean, I don't know. It does feel like a little off this move. You do? Are you sure that I've got to do this? And truth be told, I mean, maybe you do or maybe you don't. I think what you need to understand is that these kind of moves and the time that you have for them is all based on one thing. Your opponent's ability to respond and challenge. Now, if he doesn't have the chance to respond, to threaten you or challenge in any way, you have more than enough time to do this and prepare your pieces for attack. This was excellent. So don't forget to constantly look at what your opponent can do. And more importantly, what type of tactical ideas does he have? Now, after knight e2, he played queen h3, and then we have knight d4 attack, and we're going forth. We have the two rooks, the knight, then black plays bishop to the g4, bishop g2, queen h5, and uh, this is a very good position. Everything a black has is now backward. His pieces, his queen. So what to do next? Now, one of, while you're actually thinking about that, I'd like to answer a question. Please tell which is the best source uh, to on, online to become a 2000 player. Well, I mean, there is, as I mentioned to you, below the link below the video provides an 87 course, uh, course type of package, which is fantastic. And it comes at an incredible price of a few dollars per course. It's a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, like thing that you can get for an incredible for an incredible price and I, I i i've been given the opportunity to offer it to you guys because it's really really good i mean imagine it's a grandmaster course every course is a few hours long and you get it like for for a few dollars um per piece and it's it's incredible anyway um basically black just plays queen h5 and so what to do now how does white get to continue his position make it stronger and hold black down. Hmm. You know, the way you look at this position, it becomes really clear that the way white is placed, he's got everything. Like the space is good, the challenge on the e file is actually excellent, the, the pressure, it's it's all there and it's all really good. But what does what should white do now? Now I got a lot of suggestions. Knight c6, a4, bishop e4. Thank you. Those are all good looking moves. Now, which one of them do we play? Truth be told, none of them. Why? Because, for example, if we play a4, let's say, which is the most active kind of move, black will likely do bishop h3. And now if we go for something like, say, bishop e4, that was the other suggestion, I feel black is going to be comfortable enough to play b to x day. And uh, it's just not going to cause him enough trouble. You know, Carlson always had that one thing in his games that makes him stand out as opposed to the other players, and that's the ability to constantly restrict the opponent, even with the most unorthodox type of moves, like pawn to h4. That move took away the bishop h3 idea and isolated the queen, but more so, it gives us a chance to prove our domination. Given that forcing moves are not available, the restrictive moves are always the second hand. And we are playing those now because we just want to cut off the black pieces from play and gain more space and opportunities. The black knight had to go right back to the g8 now. And this is quite a beautiful opportunity to step up with his knight over this rook on c6, move close, and this was fantastic. 
We have the threat coming up against the A6. We have the pressure that's created against the B5. And uh, that's a beautiful move. One, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we just see is the extra pressure. And it's just keep the opponent constantly on the backside. Now, one of you asked, is there a way for you to contact me? Yes, you can also request me to send you those games onto my email, which is valerialilov at gmail.com. Uh, I'm annotating all these games. So basically, just if you want me to send them to you with all the annotations and the arrows and the colors, so you can add some notes. You can email me to, to this or just directly visit my website and send me a message through there. I'd love to I'd love to hear from you. It's tigerlywolf.com. Now, talking about the position after rook c6, black played knight of six, and then white just took on a6. And you're probably wondering, come on, couldn't black, couldn't black just play better? Did he really have to go through this? And the answer of that to that question is yes. I mean, seriously, what else could he do? could he do? Nothing. If you think about it, nothing could have been done in a better way. The rook on c6 is perfect. We got the pressure on a6. We got the tension on c7. And we see the inability for black to really come out. He tries, but then he loses the pawn. And then we have b5 under pressure. We've got the majority of black's other pieces completely backward. So you have to do bishop to the d7. Knight takes the b5. Rook b8 and pawn a4. And it was amazing because now we realize suddenly that not only the black isn't winning, but he is having no play at all. It's incredible, isn't it? With such simple moves, Carlson took away pretty much everything from black. Pretty much everything. So black tries to jump in with the knight. He just says, okay, I, I can't believe you did all that. So I'm going to move my knight up there. I'm going to create some threats and do some things. What what to do now? Hmm. So black's definitely going forward and trying to put pressure to certain things. What to do now? It's a really good question, really good query. Bishop f3 pin, pin him? That's right. This is the way to neutralize the opponent. We see that, uh, that black is going to have a lot of trouble in this type of position. And then he's completely unable to step out or do anything different. It is a great way to go. And it's definitely going to uh, cut him off. Given that the Black Knight really can't move and the rest of our piece, the rest of his pieces are unable to move out, this was good. It's just a lovely variation, completely, uh, you know, impossible, complete impossibility to go anywhere. So, one of the things that you need to understand is that a lot of times you need to kind of limit your opponent. You need to take advantage and restrict him by just cutting off his pieces. With the move of bishop to the f3, we do exactly that. We cut off the knight so that the black knight can't move out of the way. And uh, that was a great idea. So we have this shot. We have this fact that black can't move. And it was great. So let's see. This was a beautiful candidate. And then, of course, after that move of bishop to the f3, now black had to do queen to the h6. And now white plays alongside queen c4. Wow. I mean, the way I see how white's pieces are putting pressure versus black, c7, and the rest of his pawns and pieces is just incredible. Black can't do anything. He was so frustrated that at this point he decided, let's just do knight h4. Let's try to do something just so that we could do whatever in order to attack him. It is the only thing that he could have done, the only thing that he tries to do in order to be successful. So, what to do now? We 
very good question. See if anybody has a suggestion. Now, bishop takes g4. Absolutely right. It's terrific. We need it. This move is great because then as soon as we actually play it with the move of bishop takes the g4, we're going to take away the only piece or like one of the only pieces that he's got and uh, thereby just destroy him completely. This was a powerful move. Let's go for it. Like, rule number one about these positions is just that. Like, take away any of his important forces so that basically he loses it. And so it was great. Bishop takes g4, bishop takes g4, and g takes h. You know, it's a, it may sound a little weird, but the reality of the situation is he just doesn't have anything to do. And, uh, yes, he's just completely losing it. It's, it's incredible. It's really powerful. It's really good. And it's just completely losing for him. So, yeah, that was the move. After the move of bishop takes to, after that, after that ex exchange, bishop takes g4, he is completely unable to step out or do anything great. So let's take a look and see. Take, then bishop f3. And now we play f5. The attack of black is basically failing for the one simple reason that his pieces are not good enough to make any threats. Take, capture, we attack the bishop, and after bishop b7, rook b6. You know how you're going to stop your opponent from attacking? It's when you stop or take out his threats. If you can do that, if you can stop or take out the threats, everything in terms of attack is going to be completely impossible for the opponent to deliver. And that's what really takes place here. We just cut off completely his ability to make any threats or deliver any attacks. And it's just, it just gets bad. Like he just cannot do anything. No complications, no tactics, nothing to, to do, nothing to deliver. So uh, he plays f6, but then we play with bishop to the d4, queen f7, knight e6, rook g8. I mean, look at him. Do you believe that he could ever attack with this piece, with that queen? So he makes only one attempt to get his own rook there. So what do we do next? Black's got nothing. I totally agree. But you need to be precise. You know, you need to make sure he doesn't get more counterplay. There's a very special move with which we can cut off everything from him. Anyone? Rook c1, not a bad move. I guess it's it's fine, although he might exchange and force your queen back. I don't know if the queen isn't necessary as much as it could stay on the f4. He's defending the couple pawns. He's being useful. Now, yes, there we go. Bishop c3. Let's take away the pressure uh, by cutting off his rook. You can move the pawn right up. Now the knight has come down to the d4. And then we have the d6. And, uh, you know, Black is just in a, in a horrible danger. He has nothing to do, no chance at all or whatever uh, that he could deliver in this position. It was beautiful. So uh, once that was being, uh, once that was actually played out, Black is in a, in a horrible danger. And uh, you get to see the reality. It's just how bad that is. Like the, the knight comes back. We have the threat against the d4. There's a lot more coming up. And, uh, you know, this is, this is great. Okay, so right after that move, given the, the problems that black is definitely getting, he played bishop to a8, queen takes d6, attempt again for the queen to create threats, and we stop them. Rook c, c8, and after rook b to e6, given that there is no chance for counterplay anymore, he just resigned because uh, that was it. So just pretty much black was losing game completely what i love so much about this position what i love so much of this for this whole game was how white was able to really pick it up and then build on the position starting from these quiet moments where he knew that black was wrong with his strategy to attack 
to the point where basically after d6 and f4, he risked the pawn, then took the upper, took the liberty of knowing that black is behind on development and that pawn wouldn't matter. See, some, some very simple principles done even without calculation can help to the point of balancing. I find it incredibly interesting to really balance between the forcing, reinforcing, and restrictive moves. And I mean, a lot of people don't think about that. A lot of people just think, oh, I'm going to find a move that seems most optimistic or most optimal. Now, that doesn't work. Because if you don't really know, or if you don't try to be aware of what kind of move are you going to use, likely you wouldn't know if the time is right for this type of move. If you, if if there is nothing better, right now White knew that a forcing move is not possible, but a little bit of a reinforcing, stabilizing move it was great, and it followed by a powerful attacking move against the queen and a restrictive move by the pawn. Another reinforcing move by the rook, and when he had the time, black had nothing, he was limited. White reinforced the pieces very powerfully. Then he created the threat, and he reinforced again. Then he reinforced again, and he created the threat. See, all those moves, including h4, that was very restrictive, he just kept pushing black down again and again and again, until at one point it was such a difficult position, he really couldn't do a whole lot, and it was a... It was a fantastic sequence. It was really great to just realize how white is able to build all of that up by limiting black. I personally find this game to be one of my Carlson's favorite for that year, 2009. And even though it was played like seven years ago, it, it just, wow, it's, it blows my mind like how good he played. Once again, if you want me to send you this game with all the notes notes and everything, just uh, do send me an email to my name, to, to my email valeri.lilov at gmail.com and I'll be glad to send it to you with my, with the annotations. Now, sh how should we calculate, you asked? Well, you should calculate like by just figuring out the goal of the position and then, you know, thinking of the moves. But as you can see, it's oftentimes not necessary. Like Carlson in this game, he didn't need to do that. He just need to have this logical consecutive plan. And that's why I think that a lot of the master lectures basically explain you how to do that. That's why I do recommend you to check out the link below this video, which provides an incredible discount to an 87 course uh, like uh, master master lectures uh, that happen to be a couple of dollars or a few dollars each, which is incredible price for, for just uh, for such a course. So check this out. I just send a link on the chat as well. Now, let's talk about another game by Carlson that was so instructive to me when I first saw it. Let me show it to you guys. So we'll see. Okay. And here we go. This is this next game shows us the attack. So how to attack in a gradual and a more effective way to do. So this is what we'd like to do. I, I'm going to show you a brilliant game that was played between Magnus Carlsen and Veselin Topolov in that same tournament. This was one of Carlsen's best tournaments, actually. So, hang on. Here we go. Oh, Carlsen was white again, and he started off with d4, knight of six, c4, g6. And after knight c3, bishop g7, he played e4. Now, in every opening gaining space sets you on a good rank. So pretty much you develop the pieces right behind. And of course, there's h3. This is a very common variation, very well known. Knight a6, bishop to e3. e5 and d5. It looks so easy, right? I mean, when you look at how he's playing, it almost feels like you can play the same way. But trust me, we can. So basically, black played c6. And... Uh, up here, white chose a very interesting move that's by the book. It's g4. Now, this seems like a very risky move, but we can always bring the bishop uh, around to g2, and we realize also that if we decide we can castle long. So while the kink is going to find itself a very safe position, the extra, extra space and center by white will guarantee him a much better flexibility and a chance to start advancing against the black king. So this is very helpful. 
black played knight c5, moving up with the knight. And this was the time when white played knight d2. Something interesting that Carlsen always does is to stabilize the position. As you can see, he's leaving no necessary weaknesses. Everything just feels right, and it's to the point. A lot of players, when they play, don't tend to spend enough time on thinking about it. how does that move that they will make really weaken their position. And that's why they fail. You don't want to think about weaknesses, but you have to. So you do need to make it a habit. So black played a5 here, trying to kind of hold off b4. So here comes my question to you guys. What do you think white has to do next? What is the purpose of h3? Well, we saw it. To cover the g4 and prepare g4. Blocking the knight, exactly. So how to do, how to continue the position right now? Does anybody have an idea as to where white has to go at this point? Bishop e2, not a problem. It's a quiet move. But see, before we go on with these, I think I mentioned to you how important it is for you to look at the, re the, the, the restrictive moves. A little a3 was a pretty good move by white. Preparation is b4, so we can challenge the only black active piece. If he takes it, we can capture that knight with our bishop, and then the a4 is going to hang. So ultimately, a3 was a very necessary move. Believe me. You don't want to let your opponent just stay like that. So would we play with b4? Not really. That move would have been a little too rushed. We want to keep that possibility. And then white made a really incredible move. Now, how do you best restrict your opponent? You don't restrict him by just, you know, like just pushing him constantly behind. You restrict him by taking out some of the most important moves in the position. So whenever sometimes a student comes to me and says, Valeri, give me a checklist. Tell me what are the questions I got to ask myself when I play. I tell them three things. I tell them, think about what your opponent wants to do with his last move. Think about what you should plan. And think about what he will respond to your move, whatever it is that you've decided. You do it long enough, and you do it at your own turn, every time, over and over and over again you are going to develop a good sense of danger. The sense of what is my opponent's strongest possibility and how do I fight it. Black's ability now is to play f5, which would have given him the chance to open. So white played rook g1 in preparation against that. Apparently if black tries f5 now, g takes f and the whole exchange would really, you know, like terrify black as uh, once he takes, we can have rook takes g7 destroying the king as defense, and, uh, well, when you do realize that after queen g4, he either have to, has to lose the rook, or queen h4, his queen falls. That was powerful. And you see, the best restrictive moves are often the moves which limit the opponent from his strongest ideas. So thinking about what is he really going to do always helps. So now black plays a4. Now, sometimes your opponent might have an intention, but it's not a strong one. It's not going to give him any challenge. That's how you can often realize if his move or his ideas are actually strong or maybe not. A4 just didn't feel like it caused any trouble. White played queen c2, knight b6, long side castles hiding the king, and after bishop b7, king b1. It was just pretty. There's no other way to put it. Very pretty development. Exchange, takes, and rook c8. So we've gotten kind of to the middle game. What do you think white has to do at this point? I mean, apparently king side attack going is good. But black is sort of setting up his own pieces. And he wants to do some stuff on his own. So what should we do now? Should we play h4? Should we do something else? What would you guys say white should do now? Why king b1? Well, that move was played so that we can take away the king from danger. Okay. Getting out of the c-file, apparently. But um, 
this was important. We can play h4, we can play g5, but I don't know. Yes, what's so much better is that we play bishop b5. You see, this move not only completes the development, but it helps us to exchange one of the potential attackers on the queen side. It was a really beautiful move by white. Again, very active, very advanced, and very restrictive. It looks simpler, but, you know, most people wouldn't find it. See, that's what I, I love about simplicity. Queen d7 and knight c3. So now, seeing that most of the threats for black have actually disappeared on the queen side, he realized that danger is going to come. If there are opposite castle kings, if you don't know, essentially the idea is that whoever reaches the opponent faster with his pawns can be extremely successful. Now, given that black has no opportunity to do that whatsoever for the short you know, future, white, on the other hand, is going to go for h4, h5, and you realize there isn't just going to be that pawn moving against black's king. There's going to be a quick and effective opportunity to, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, just, just attack. So, like, uh, this was a powerful move to do. Uh, so, like, that's what we do in this type of position. Uh, after after continuing with the queen to the d7, so white played with knight c3 and bishop f6. So white played the move of g5. He pushed the black bishop out of the way, and then there is the move h4. So uh, after the h4, we do the move of h5 out there. We got a threat. We have the rook to h1 coming up. We have a really good sequence, and it's it's beautiful. Black played knight a8. So we realize how pathetic black's position has started to be. And it is. It is. So uh, how is the bishop on d7 an attacker? Well, it wasn't. But it could have been. could have supported b5. It could have supported knight to the b3. It was a piece that was lined up to that area. So why did the black bishop leave the king? Now, that's a really good question. I'm not sure. I guess he was just trying to probably bring some other pieces on the queen side and uh, I guess he needed to do that but um, yeah I think g5 still sort of opens up the game so how do we advance now does anybody have a suggestion on what white should do next should we do h4 or shall we challenge him in some other way Rook h1. You know what? That's not such a bad idea. But, um, see, sometimes if you want to really restrict the opponent, you want to take away his best pieces. And I really mean it. Like, finding out what his best pieces are and, like, how do we get rid of them could be a big resource. And I mean, like, a really big resource. So there is a way. There is something great. What should white do now? <laughs> I think this is a great position to talk about. Like really the space and activity of and most of what white has already gotten. So what to do now? F4. Bishop takes c5 or rook g2? Good choices. But Carlson played bishop takes the c5. He wanted to basically take out whatever piece was standing in the way. Now, I'd like to clarify something I pointed out in one of the previous webinars. What makes an attack really successful? It's the circumstances plus the strong pieces that help him to deliver the threats. And those threats can lead to initiative or a successful attack. Now, if you take out the circumstances or especially the active pieces, then he's not going to have these attacking moves anymore. Now, that's what we want to do. Bishop takes c5, took down the black knight, which was only more important in relation to his play. And then white just took the pawn. I mean, come on, you're going to say, Valeri, black may just blunder, blunders, he just just blundered his pawn. He didn't. 
who's ready to sacrifice it. But because his pieces are so restricted at that point, he can't reach out and make any delivery of threats. It's a really special fee ability to kind of understand what the opponent's most important or advanced pieces are and get the chance to eliminate them. It's something that White did with a very great precision. So now the queen's coming right back. Queen h3. And uh, would anybody care to tell me how can White get more control here and more opportunities? Rook g3, not a bad idea, but you see queen f3 is great because what you do in this position is you neutralize. That's the point we want, or that, that's the thing we want. When that move takes place, you get to see the real problem and the real danger out there. So actually, after continuing with the move of uh, queen to the f3, in case black plays queen takes f3, and uh, that's great. It's serious, very good in this position, and um, yeah, hmm. very, very valuable in this, in this move. After, after continuing with the move of uh, queen f3, apparently black doesn't have much. So uh, what if he takes the pawn? You're probably wondering, okay, but this is a blunder, right? No, it's not. The queen is working alone, while our pieces are not. We can make a move of rook to the g4 drive away the black queen and then after rook to g4 if it plays with queen h5 we do rook to h1 to really tie it tie it down and, and target him that was brilliant after queen f3 black played queen to the d7 and then white made the move queen to d3 see if if we just keep our pieces away he can't reach us he can't create those he, sometimes he can't even create those circumstances that will help him deliver threats. So White chose his step-by-step -step similar approach. Strengthen the position until your opponent pushes first, and it makes the weaknesses. Exchange, takes, and pawn up to the h5, which happened in this position. And uh, so uh, that's that was a great idea. Okay, and well, we have the, the, the h5 and the challenge against the opponent's uh, king. We got the knight or maybe the queen. And the rest of the pieces are quite powerful. The rest of our pieces are quite powerful. And uh, it was beautiful. Let's see what happens next. Okay, after that variation, uh, we have this setup. And then, for example, after that, we have queen e3 queen e and rook h1 what happens next okay on c h5 and it was rook takes f2 i mean black got a hope he got this possibility to advance or take target target the f2 then we do h takes g and and why did white really give it away can anybody guess right or like why did why did white allow this to happen Why is rook c2 played? Well, that will be realized with the next move. Very strong idea. Doesn't queen take queen kill the white attack? Uh, no, he doesn't. Because white already has a material advantage. Remember, when you have a material advantage, you want to exchange. So yeah, in some way, it might kill his attack. But for the most part, there is nothing dangerous. So... Don't worry about it. He can't do anything dangerous. So let's just go to the point of um, queen d3, c2, exchange, h5, and h takes g. Do now. Rook takes g6 now. Interesting suggestion. 
Did Carlson play Rook takes G6? Yes, he could have. That's why Black didn't play with uh, H takes G. You see, once again, there's this perfect coordination of the Queen and Rook together. See, in every game that we see, we see how the white pieces, like all Carlson's pieces, are perfectly working with one another, as opposed to the opponents that are just not. And so as Black played with the move of H6, this next move killed off any initiative that Black had at all. It was simply great. So could anyone tell me what White should do to, to cut off Black's attack? Now we can do knight of three, absolutely. But you see, I don't think we're we're really gonna deal with the both rooks. Now what black act, what white actually did, was the move of knight d one, that killed off the the challenge of both of black's rooks, the one on c five and the one on f uh, on the f two. So um, okay, this is very important, and um, so that's what we need to do. The most very uh, the most valuable thing is to, to prevent the opponent from actually having his pieces to attack us or threaten and after knight d1 rook takes the c2 knight takes f2 rook c8 and knight g4 we get to see how white speed is just moving forward directly towards the black king and attacking him effectively knight of three came through so we have the two knights, and we have the fact that, I mean, look at black. I want you to think about the real reason why he's got any of those pieces. He won't find one. There is nothing those pieces mean. There's no challenge. There's no pressure in this case. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, what white is doing is to just keep black down. And so what black does is knight c4, knight takes g5, h takes g5, and especially now why play knight e3 there is no piece that carlson ever allows to be in the side of territory i want you to check this out this is a very important type of thing and uh, you see uh, the number one kind of thing is just that we'd love to advance and uh, you know create some threats do things as well and um, uh, okay well after that knight e3 knight takes e3 queen takes e3 Black plays queen a4. So what do we do now? Hmm. Artistic move and ideas. I don't think so. Simple moves and ideas. I think so. Everybody can do them, right? I can do them. You can do them. No. Sorry. I disappoint you now. <laughs> you see, I mean, it's like, I don't know if you guys watch movies. I'm a big fan of Quentin Tarantino's movies, and because of some movies like the, the, you know that have nothing but dialogue, I got I got very interested in like the way he's writing them, and you could see a lot of the you know like the simple, completely senseless conversations are incredibly interesting. You know, it sounds like anybody could just write down a conversation like that and can sound incredibly interesting. And it's not. I mean, he, it's it's just his thing. He's doing it so simple and so natural and so interesting that anybody else who does that basically <laughs> cannot do it even remotely the same way. So I want you to actually consider the similarity to Carlson's games. His games are incredibly simple, but other people can't do it like that. They can't do it as simple. They don't have the, the talent and the consistency. Now, what you can do is to borrow a little bit of this magic and try to actually challenge the opponent. So this was very important. Why played Queen takes G5? He didn't need anything more special. He just wanted to step forward. And uh, so um, that is the thing. We have Queen takes to the E7 coming, Queen to E7 coming. We got the Black King really behind or backward. And uh, so and this is very, very interesting. After that move happened, 
black is just bad. He took, and there's king a1. And then there's rook e8, and now white joins the rook and the queen into the attack against the black king, which actually seems unstoppable if you think about it. And uh, and this is this is very important. So like uh, after we come forward with this, things are good, and definitely the position is fairly bad for black. Awesome, very strong ideas. See, think about that. The simplicity comes from three kinds of moves: forcing, enforcing, and restrictive. So if you're ever wondering about what type of move to do, think about this. Can I attack my opponent? No, I can't. Can I restrict him on an important move? Yes. No, I can't. Can I improve a piece that needs to be improved? Yes, I can. You'll almost always find something significant you can do in that regard, even if there is no concrete plan. See, that's just what Carlson does constantly in his games, and he's so good and so successful. So yes, I want to say that uh, like getting that sort of level is never too easy. But something that I love about each of the games that we looked at is this incredible way on how he never allowed even the remote possibility of danger. An advanced piece of the opponent was chopped off. A weakness was never allowed. A, an important square to be weakened was never there. So it felt really like a flawless game in regards to positional play. Something that's very hard to achieve but there are elements that you can try to apply, and as I said, borrow at least a little bit of his magic. So I hope you like those games, and I do recommend you to check this incredible course. 87 hours of, I mean, 87 courses, it's more than 87 hours, it's twice the, the, the time, for a few dollars each. It's it's incredible price, it's, it's basically for free. And what is so interesting is that you can get a lot of a lot of the default process behind Mind Master games on openings, middle game, and so on. Check it out. I guarantee you're going to have a lot of fun and you'll find it perfect. Thank you so much again for joining me. I hope you had a good time. And I will speak to you next Saturday at the same time.